Hello, everybody. It is, it is so awesome, right, to be here in person, to see you all, to see the large crowd, which I know is a, is a large part due to our speaker today. But before I get to introducing our speaker, Scott Denning, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of the Distinguished Ecologist Program. It turns out the GDPE Visiting Distinguished Ecologist Program actually predates GDPE. So we, we brought in our, we, not me, but people back in the 70s and 79 brought in the first visiting distinguished ecologist then, uh, so many, many years ago. A uh, quick trivia question, anyone have any idea who that first distinguished ecologist was that visited CSU in 79? Any guesses? It was Eugene Odom, yes, so the father of ecosystem ecology, as many would know. So he was the first speaker that came here in 79. In 2005, um, I was on the executive committee at GDP at the time, um, and we were discussing the various nominees to put who were going to be the visiting distinguished ecologists for that next year. And someone, I don't remember who, made the comment that these are all great nominees, but you know, we have just as good a people here at CSU as we have from outside. And we've spent 25 years bringing in people from outside. Maybe we should think about inviting some of our own local distinguished ecologists as well. And that idea just immediately caught on with the committee. And the very next year, in 2006, we began the Resident Distinguished Ecologist Program to complement the Visiting Distinguished Ecologist Program. Um, the first speaker in that, uh, of the Resident Distinguished Eco Ecology Program was Dan Binkley, who was the longtime <clears throat> director of GDPE. So with that bit of background, that brings me to um, my introduction of Scott Denning today. Now, Scott Denning is no um, stranger to GDPE and, and to the students in GDPE. If you've, you've taken Foundations of Ecology, you know Scott has guest lectured in there for many, many years. Um, he actually gives two lectures um, most years, so he's no stranger to the students. Um, you should know he's a, he's a world-renowned scientist, world-renowned ecologist. Um, I could tell you a lot about the number of papers he's published, like, something like over 120, cited thousands of times, all those sorts of things. He's received many, many awards in his career, although I think this will be the pinnacle award of your career. Um, at least you want to tell us that. Um, and he's received funding from a variety of, of sources throughout his long and distinguished career. Um, but I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about those metrics and numbers. What I instead want to tell you about is how I realized what an amazing scientist Scott is. Um, I had an opportunity to attend a AG, uh, American Geophysical Union Chapman Conference a couple of years before the pandemic hit. Um, and it was, uh, it was on carbon climate feedback. So it was about global carbon cycle right in Scott's wheelhouse. I was way out of my element at this particular conference, but it was great to sit there and listen to all these people talk about these global issues uh, with the global carbon cycle. Now, as I sit in this conference and listen to all these talks, one thing I noticed is on most of the talks had at least one or two slides that were citing Denning at all. Scott Denning's work was cited on these slides. So, well, that's pretty interesting. He, maybe he's a pretty big deal. You know, I, knew, I knew he was pretty cool here, but maybe he's a pretty big deal at this international conference as well. Um, and then something really struck me as an audience participant. And, and what struck me was how much people paid attention to what Scott said during this particular conference. And the best way I can describe that for you um, has to do with what came to my mind right, during this conference. So I was sitting there listening to this conference saw Scott stand up. The first thing I thought of was a commercial that I remember seeing as, a, as someone in the late 70s. Um, it was a commercial for E.F. Hutton, right? Any, anyone old enough to remember the E.F. Hutton commercials from the 70s? Scott certainly does, a few of you do. Most of you don't, right? Most of you weren't around during that time. So let me just give you a thumbnail of what those commercials were all about. So E.F. Hutton was a stockbroker firm, right? And all these commercials had the same basic format. There'd be two people talking about investing stocks. They'd always be in a crowded situation, like a restaurant or in a city park or somewhere. And one person would say what they were going to invest in, and the other person would always say, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And E.F. Hutton says, and everyone in the commercial background would stop, right? They would stop what they were doing, put their hands in their ear, and they would listen to what that person was going to say. And the narrator would say, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen, right? That's what it was like watching Scott at this particular conference. When he spoke up, when he raised his hand, when he stood up and made a comment, people turned around in their chairs, everyone stopped their conversations, and they listened to what Scott said. And, I, and that's when I really knew that he's really a big deal, right? So I'm very happy to have Scott speak here today. I can't suggest you follow his stock tips, but I do suggest you listen to him because I view him as the E.F. Hutton of GDPE. Scott? Well, I, I definitely um, don't 
follow my, my stock tips. I, I, don't, I don't have any. <laughs> uh, so I would like to talk with you today. Um, actually, can we get the big lights down? I, I feel like it's hard to see the screen. Um, so I'd like to talk with you today about, um, about the carbon cycle. Um, but in particular, I want to focus on an idea that has a lot of, of sort of cultural currency now, which is the idea that uh, we, we need to get to net zero emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in order to solve our climate problem. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that um, that actually doesn't necessarily mean what, what you think it means. So uh, we're still working on the lights here. Almost there. Uh, so um, let me start by asking you this kind of silly question. Um, is climate binary? Do, you, you sort of might imagine that, you know, the world is good and uh, we, we live in this shire, right? We live in this green, <laughs> lovely place. And, uh, you know, it starts getting a little bit warmer and, and then a little bit warmer. And then we cross this bright line and boom, we're in Mordor, right? It's, it's just terrible. It's a catastrophe. You know, I can't see my slides, man. Can you, can you dim the lights? Yes. All right. So um, the answer is no. Climate is, climate is non-binary. It, it's important to have goals. Policy requires targets. We, we have to have uh, lines in the sand that we set for ourselves to give us targets to, to live within. But the real climate is gradually changing from cool to warm to hot, and there's essentially an infinite gradient from, from bad to worse. Uh, there, there, there really is not a sharp line between everything is great and then everything's terrible. And in some ways, I have to admit, this, this kind of sucks. This is kind of hard on us psychologically um, be, because we don't have the comfort of saying, okay, we're on the, the right side of that line, everything's good. Um, in fact, we have to live our lives and do the work to build an ambiguous future, a future that we will make as good as we can um, and know that it might have been better. Uh, this, this is a harder job for us, sort of spiritually, than it, than it might have otherwise been. So the outline of this talk, uh, first I'm going to take you through uh, what I call climate modeling on the back of an envelope. So a very, very simple uh, climate model that is super well established. Re really, people have been using this particular uh, equation, it's just a little piece of algebra, for um, 125 years. So it, it's, it's not new rocket science kind of stuff. Um, and then we're going to look at the implications of that model for this phrase that has become kind of a buzz phrase in climate circles, keeping 1.5 alive, right? The idea that there's a, a 1.5 degree above pre-industrial target, which we would like to stay on the good side of. Um, and it, it turns out that it's very hard to stay on, on the good side of that number. Um, then I want to talk about carbon sinks. Uh, and you probably all have heard about carbon sinks and thought about carbon sinks. And I know the GDP students have seen me talk about carbon sinks before. But I'm going to review that. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about how sinks can overflow, which is kind of a problem. Um, and then I'm going to introduce you to something that you may not really have heard very much about, but which is very, very important in climate modeling uh -oh, these days. Now, that's not good. All right, Mr. AV man, we got, we got nothing on the screen. Uh, the, the thing that I want to introduce after sinks is called TCRE, the Transient Climate Response to Emissions. It's kind of a you know, jargony thing, technical thing, uh, but it's super important. And it turns out that framing the uh, keeping 1.5 alive and keep, keeping on the good side of, uh, of future climate depends now almost entirely on this concept in sort of IPCC world. So I'm going to talk about that and then finally finish up uh, returning to this concept of living with ambiguity. So you've probably heard this before. Uh, but there, there has been, for 125 years, a very, very well-established um, concept in climate that gases absorb radiation 
in proportion to the log of their concentration. So now, what the hell am I talking about? Um, adding 100 ppm of CO2 absorbs some heat, and warms up the world, but the next 100 ppm of CO2 does not absorb as much heat as that last 100 ppm of CO2. And you can imagine this by thinking of it as like pairs of sunglasses, right? If I put on a pair of sunglasses, let's say it takes out 30% of the light. If I put another pair of, of sunglasses on top of those, it absorbs 30% of what's left, but that's less than the 30% that the first pair absorbed, right? And if you just keep layering sunglasses on there, each, each pair of sunglasses absorbs somewhat less light than the one before. So this is called logarithmic, this kind of dependence. And it's not unique to CO2 or global warming. This is true of any absorbing gas. This is sort of a fundamental principle of, of spectroscopy. It's like the, the law of diminishing returns, right? That, that's what this is. Um, now this has been tested in the lab, and it's been tested outdoors, it's been tested in balloons, it's been tested from airplanes, it's been tested from satellites. We know this is the case, right? This is not uh, a, a new thing. This is very, very well established. And we have this equation, three times the log of the CO2 divided by 280 divided by the log of two. Um, and that three number, that's what we call the equilibrium climate sensitivity. Um, and you know, we can argue about whether it's three and a half or is it 2.7 or whatever, but it's about three. But the point is three degrees of warming per what? Three degrees of warming per doubling of CO2, right? Not, not per 200 ppm or per you know, X amount of gigatons, Three, three Celsius of warming globally per doubling of CO2. Uh, okay, so global warming on the back of an envelope. I've even provided a convenient envelope here. Uh, suppose we want to limit eventual global warming to some arbitrary number, delta T, um, using that equation that I just showed you, which you all nodded like you believed me. Um, the, the, what, what that implies is that the if, if you want to set delta T as the final amount of delta, you know, temperature change, uh, the CO2 must stay below some number where that has an exponential in it, because you know exponentials are the opposite of logs. That that's you, you remember that from I don't know ninth grade or something like that. Well, yeah, no, eleventh grade. Um, so some examples to limit warming to three degrees. Just plugging in three in here. The CO2, um, well, I told you, is doubling, right? So the pre-industrial CO2 was 280. CO2 has to stay below 560. You want to say 2.5 degrees, OK, your CO2 has to stay below 499. For 2 degrees, it has to stay below 445. Anybody know what the CO2 is today, nowadays? Put, put 418, 419, so, something like that. Uh, to limit to 1.5, CO2 has to stay below 396. Uh-oh, we, we got a problem because CO2 is already something like 420 or 417. So how is 1.5 still alive, right? This, this actually looks like we've already blown through this. It's worse than that because CO2 equivalent also includes increases in methane and N2O and other gases that have contributed to this. We're cutting back on uh, you know, reflective pollutant aerosols that have previously cooled us. That's going to add warming. So there's all this other stuff. So this is actually pretty grim. If you just use the straight up math that we've known since 1896, uh, and you probably know these numbers too. Uh, global fossil fuel emissions, about 10 gigatons a year. Now, uh, there's a units problem. Everybody has problems with this, okay? Um, economists, policy wonks, politicians, people like that, they tend to use a unit we call gigatons of CO2. But as ecologists, we prefer to talk about gigatons of carbon because carbon, you know, it's not all CO2, right? There's, there's organic matter, there's trees, there's dissolved CO2, and there's all kinds of stuff that is not CO2. So we use gigatons of carbon, and just FYI, a gigaton of CO2 um, weighs, well, no, a gigaton, just, no, never mind what I just said. So, so if you take a gigaton of carbon and you react it with oxygen, it makes 3.7 gigatons of CO2. So to convert this number to CO2, it's 37. 
So, so our current emissions of fossil fuel uh, carbon is about 10 gigatons, that's billions of tons. Um, I often use this, so this is fun. Uh, a ton of water is precisely one cubic meter. You, you sort, sort of amazing, right? One, one cubic meter of water weighs precisely one ton, metric. Uh, a gigaton is precisely one cubic kilometer of water. So imagine water the size of CSU and then piled that high again, that's a gigaton. And believe it or not, people, busy little beavers that we are, dig up 10 times that much carbon every single year, transport it all over the freaking world and sell it from every 7-Eleven street corner on the planet. It, it's, it's quite an achievement that we can find that much um, amount of carbon and, and dig it up and set it on fire. But, but that's, that's a different talk. Uh, so I'm having some trouble with the AV here. Uh, so you think I should just jiggle the, the wire? You know, I use this in class all the time. It doesn't do this. All right, 25% of that 10 gigatons dissolves into the oceans. Now, we call it planet Earth but it probably ought to be called planet ocean, right? This is, uh, I went on semester at sea right into the teeth of COVID. Uh, we sailed from San Diego on New Year's Day of 2020 all the way across the Pacific. And by the time we got to Asia, um, it was grim. And uh, people tell me it's a small world, but I tell you, if you cross the Pacific at 12 knots, it, it's not a small world. It, it's <laughs> really, really big. Um, so there's a lot of ocean, and the oceans are, are actually removing about 25% of that fossil fuel emitted CO2. 25% of the CO2 that we emit from burning stuff turns into biomass on land. This is a remarkable thing. Uh, so about, about a quarter in the oceans and a quarter on land, and 50% of it remains in the air. So you can just sort of get, get uh, uh, a rule of thumb out of this that you can remember, um, five gigatons of carbon injected into the air turns into two and a half ppm of CO2 per year. So if we got 417 now, and we had to stop at 396, um, you could see that this is getting to be a problem, right? Every year it goes up by about two and a half ppm. So what the hell am I talking about that the, that the carbon in the air turns into carbon on land? So you all know, because you're ecologists, that plants eat CO2 for a living, right? It's fundamentally the miracle of life. I mean, this is inorganic dead air that um, is transformed into living protoplasm. And, and it's, it's incredible that it does this, right? If we could do this, we wouldn't have to go to work. Um, it, it's a wonderful thing. Um, so way back in the 1960s, um, Oceanographers and atmospheric scientists suggested that, in fact, adding CO2 to the air makes plants bigger, makes plants bulk up. Now, not really. The, the people who study photosynthesis knew this, but uh, the idea is actually remarkably simple. It's basically the same thing as what happens when there's Girl Scout cookies in my kitchen. Um, just the fact that they're there, my biomass increases over time. Um, so, so uh, we know for sure that you can grow plants in a greenhouse. These are rice plants grown at different uh, CO2 concentrations in a greenhouse. And sure enough, you crank up the CO2 in a greenhouse and you get bigger, bigger potted rice plants. Um, but that does not necessarily explain why there's a carbon sink on land because of death. Because all things die. So just the fact that you have more plants or bigger plants doesn't mean that you've stored more carbon because those plants die. And then they get eaten by microbes and turn back into CO2, right? The, the whole idea of uh, cycling is that there's, there's an equal amount of respiration that's putting CO2 into the air as is taking CO2 out of there. Now, you may not have thought this through, but it's, it's actually an amazing thing. One seventh of all of the CO2 in the air every year is turned into plants. So left to their own devices, in seven years, the plants would have removed every molecule of CO2 from the atmosphere, and it would be the end of the world. 
So clearly that's not what happens because microbes and other oxygen respirers um, create one seventh of all the CO2 in the atmosphere every year through decomposition. Uh, and we know that over a long period of time, growth and death were very closely balanced. So this is ice core data um, back to the year 1000 from a coastal Antarctica location that has a lot of accumulating snow. And you can see that CO2 was very, very steady uh, before the Industrial Revolution. There were some little wiggles, but uh, on the whole, the amount of photosynthesis and the amount of decomposition, that is the amount of growth and the amount of death, were almost perfectly balanced. And not really just back to the year 1000, but for many, many thousands of years. Growth and death uh, are, are balanced. But when we say that there's a net carbon sink on land, we are, we are asserting that plants are growing faster than they're dying. Now, this is a remarkable thing. Uh, when I was in graduate school, um, people didn't believe this. People actually thought that plants were dying faster than they were growing because of tropical deforestation and plowing the prairie and you know, paving paradise and putting up a parking lot. Uh, but it is actually true of the Earth as a whole that since we've had good measurements of CO2, we do the math and about 25% of fossil fuel combustion is going into expanding the biosphere. Re remarkable thing. How is this possible given all the destruction that we see around us, right? We, we can actually uh, measure it and we can uh, try to map it from satellites and so forth. So this CO2 fertilization concept um, was, was thrown around as an explanatory mechanism for this a long time ago. And you can think of it like this, that as CO2 increases over time, the amount of growth responds to the increasing CO2. And then there's some delay. Uh, you know, if it's a blade of grass in my backyard, it might only be a couple of weeks. If it's a giant sequoia, it might be millennia, right? The, the, the residence time of carbon in living things is, is some variable amount of time. And integrated over the entire biosphere, it's about 20 years. It might, might be 15. But it's, it's on the order of a decade or two. Because of this delay, then, in any given year, there's more growth than there is decomposition. And that's the concept of the CO2-driven sink. So, so maybe this is, uh, this is really going on. And of course, we have now um, hundreds of experiments, not just in greenhouses, but outdoors, where uh, people have actually grown outdoor ecosystems in elevated CO2, di different levels of elevated CO2, called free air carbon enrichment. The idea, I mean, it's really hard. Uh, you have to set up these towers, and you have a sensor in the middle, and depending which way the wind is blowing, you're emitting more CO2 out of that side. And if the wind blows faster, you have to emit more CO2. And, and so trying to keep the concentration constant within one of these rings over all weather over many years is, is really a challenge. Um, and they try to do it with contr you know, control rings and uh, water effects, nitrogen effects, warming effects, and so forth. Most of these studies show that the, the elevated CO2 rings um, put on more growth, put on more NPP, uh, for a period of time compared to the ambient CO2 rings, and then the effect goes away. And the effect goes away because of running out of something else. And that something else is quite often nitrogen uh, because there's only so much mineral nitrogen in the soil or the ecosystem is decomposing it at a certain rate, and there's, there's only so much available nitrogen that the plants can then pair with that CO2 in order to make the plants grow faster. And then if you give them more nitrogen, after they, they, they flatten out, then poof, you get this, you know, another 10 years of growth, and then it flattens out again. So there's this idea that nitrogen or other nutrients uh, are limiting this. Now, as it turns out, we're also giving plants loads and loads of nitrogen, right? So, so uh, 100 years ago, people were worried that the human population was going to crash because there wasn't enough available, bioavailable nitrogen. Um, Haber and Bosch invented a way to suck N2 out of the air and turn it into ammonia and make, make chemical fertilizer out of that. Um, and that led to, you know, the Green Revolution and feeding billions of people. 
Uh, as it turns out, we also inadvertently make a lot of fixed nitrogen through high temperature combustion. So industrial combustion, even in your car, you compress in the air 20 to 1, and then you, you know, in, initiate a spark in there, and you're actually burning a little bit of air. The N2 and the O2 react and make NO and NO2, and it goes, it's like miracle growth from the skies, right? It comes down, uh, downwind of, of uh, industrial areas, downwind of, uh, of um, heavily populated areas. And then to the extent that you have um, nitrogen limitation, then you, you get um, fertilization, co-fertilization by CO2 and nitrogen in, in those places. Um, changing land use is kind of a, a squirrely thing. You know, of course, we are paving paradise and putting up a parking lot. We are deforesting the tropics, uh, but we're also reforesting. So um, when I, I grew up in New England and I would go hiking out in the woods and you find these lovely stone walls that are constructed. Uh, and you're like, what the hell did somebody put that nice stone wall out in the middle of the forest? Well, of course, it didn't used to be a forest, right? Well, th there was no forest in New England in 1850 or 1875. Uh, basically, it was farms and pastures, and these were, were marking somebody's boundary of their pastures or keeping their cattle in or whatever. Uh, but those farmers' grandchildren uh, lost the farm and moved to town and got jobs at you know shoe stores or 7-Elevens or whatever. And the, the woods have grown back. And so like every tree in Vermont, every molecule of wood in every tree in Vermont used to be a CO2 molecule. The, 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 the wood in eastern forests is much, much greater than it was, say, 100 years ago. So, so this is a part of our, of our sink story. Um, and the other really big one is boreal warming. Uh, this is satellite estimates of uh, greening, growth changes in the high latitudes. Um, much of the Arctic is warming more than twice as fast. In fact, Arctic-wide, it's more like three times as fast as the global mean. And so in many, many places, over huge areas of land, uh, you know, there's a lot of land at 60 North, um, a lot of that land has half again as many frost-free days every summer as it used to have. And so you've got, like, you know, woody plants invading into the tundra and uh, trees invading into the taiga and so forth. There's sort of northward progression of the ecotone um, over time. And so all of these things are contributing. The oceans are fascinating too. Uh, the oceans are, are much bigger than the land and hold vastly more carbon than the land. And the big thing that happens in the ocean is precisely the same chemistry that makes carbonated water. Okay, so CO2 plus water, liquid water, makes carbonic acid, H2CO3 that then dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ion, and then that dissociates further into carbonate and another hydrogen ion. Um, this is why beer goes good with pizza. Um, it's literally carbonic acid that makes your beverage um, cut through the cheese on your palate. You know, this is like uh, classic pairings of, of Chardonnay and Brie and so forth. Um, it, it dissolves twice as well in cold water as it does in warm water. Um, which is actually why beer and soda go flat when you leave the beer on the, on the counter, um, because the temperature goes up and the CO2 comes out of solution. And it's also why the cold polar ocean soaks up massive amounts of CO2, it's transported into the tropics, and then it degasses in the tropics and is returned to the atmosphere. Uh, the oceans are dark and deep. Um, if you've ever been snorkeling, you know that uh, near the surface of the water, um, there's all these beautiful colored fish, you can see all these pretty corals, uh, you, you can admire each other's colorful bathing suits. Um, but if you go down, particularly the scuba divers notice this, you go down even maybe 30 feet and those colors start to disappear. The, the reds go first and then the, the oranges and the yellows and by the time you get below about 50 feet, even to 100 feet, which is sort of scuba uh, limit, everything is just these progressively dimmer shades of blue. There is no color. The, the light is removed. But the oceans aren't 100 feet deep. The oceans are 13,000 feet deep. There, there's this vast, pitch black, dark vault under there. Davy Jones Locker. It's very, very cold, too. It, it's, it's 
almost the entire volume of the ocean is three degrees Celsius or colder. V virtually the entire, I mean, it's just this little teeny thin skin of water that floats on the top that is warmer than three degrees Celsius. And the only place in the world that the water can get down there into Davy Jones' locker is where it's colder than three degrees Celsius at the surface. The water, not the air. The water itself has to be very, very cold in order to go down there. And that happens at the poles. So this is a schematic of the cross-section of the ocean. Here's the South Pole and here's the North Pole. There's this raft of buoyant warm water that floats on top like a skin, like cork. It can't sink. In the high latitudes in the winter, so right now, you know, thank your lucky stars that you live in a warm place like Colorado and not like Greenland. So up there right now, it is bad, right? It's dark, it's 40 below, there are 50 foot seas. Wow, I'm glad I'm not there, right? But up there, that water gets really, really cold in the winter and it can sink. We call that North Atlantic deep water and it sinks to the, almost the bottom of the ocean and it flows south. Similarly, in Antarctica in July, you're making this ridiculously cold water and it sinks and it carries uh, carbon and other things to the bottom of the ocean. But this great big, uh, uh, so about one one thousandth of the ocean sinks every year due to this extreme polar cold, which means it takes a thousand years to fill up the ocean from the bottom up, right? So it's like a, it's like you got a bathtub with a, a faucet on either end and psh, 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 and it, it takes a thousand years to fill up the tub. This great big volume in the middle doesn't know we're here yet. That water has not touched the air since the time of William the Conqueror. That water is completely naive to the presence of industrial civilization, it has no dissolved anthropogenic chemicals in it. Only the surface exchanges molecules with the atmosphere and these very, very cold tongues of water that come down from either end. Now, how do we know this? Uh, we actually forced underpaid graduate students to go out to sea for months at a time and drop these things called rosettes to the bottom of the ocean. These look like lines, but they're actually dots. And every one of these dots, they're, they're uh, 50 kilometers apart, are places where an alarm went off and everybody had to get up and go out on deck and drop one of these things to the bottom of the ocean. They bring them back up and they sample all the different depths and they bring them back on board and they, they do lab experiments and measure the chemistry of that, of that water. So we have phenomenal data now, 3D data on the body of the ocean. And what, what this shows is that um, there's this, so here's the depth cross section from south to north of the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific and the colors, of course you can't make much out here on the screen, but the colors show how much anthropogenic CO2 there is dissolved in that water. And there's virtually none at depth, right? It's, it's just this little thin, uh, thin skin. So where, where has it all gone? Uh, into the oceans by solubility, the cold water, um, takes up a lot of CO2 and then it sinks to, de to great depth. Um, there's also a biological uh, carbon pump in the ocean where phytoplankton are eaten by zooplankton or eaten by bigger zooplankton and eventually eaten by something that's big enough to poop out a, a little, sorry, a little turd that, that uh, is able to sink into Davy Jones' locker before it is decomposed and then the carbon is delivered to, to depth like that. Uh, on the land, we got the CO2 fertilization we got nutrient fertilization, nitrogen deposition. We got forest regrowth. There's also forest destruction, right? But, but the net is taking up carbon. And then there's this response to changing climates. So there's all these different things and we can sort of chart them out. This is from the Global Carbon Project. They've tried to reconstruct all of these different processes for 150, 175 years now. Uh, these are fossil fuel emissions. This is deforestation. Uh, everything above zero is being emitted to the atmosphere and then everything below zero is, is a sink. I mean, the atmosphere is being considered a sink here, but it's just the residual. Uh, so the oceans take up a big chunk, about 25%. The land takes up a big chunk. The atmosphere takes up about 50%. Um, interestingly, deforestation is only about 10% of, of emissions. So, so just to make sure that you don't forget that, that 
that the main thing we need to do is stop setting shit on fire. Um, yes, we have to stop cutting down trees, but, but you know, setting carbon on fire is kind of our big problem. Um, but remarkable how both the land and the ocean have continued to take up more and more and more and more carbon. My entire life! I mean, this was first discovered in the, the year I was born was when Dave Keeling started making these measurements and comparing it to fossil fuel emissions. It's like, well, man, just half of it's going away. And that half has not shrunk. It has grown with the fossil fuel emissions over the years. OK, so moving on to the next little piece of this, I want to talk to you about um, coupling climate and the carbon cycle. So um, it used to be that all climate models, I mean, really, until about a decade ago, Climate models would, would ask, climate modelers would ask economists and demographers and social scientists, how much CO2 do you think will be emitted in you know, 2040, 2050? And they would do these scenarios. And then taking those scenarios as input, climate modelers would then calculate temperature changes. Right. So this is sort of the standard IPCC. But starting about, uh, well, actually, more than 10 years ago, 2006, a subset of climate modelers um, started actually calculating uh, the land uptake and the ocean uptake independently and then predicting the CO2. R rather than uh, being told what the CO2 was, we take the CO2 emissions scenarios and then we you know, have the biology and chemistry eat those part of those emissions and we have a residual, which is the atmospheric CO2, and we calculate the climate from that. And the climate can then interact with the biogeochemistry and with the ocean chemistry and all kinds of stuff. So uh, lo and behold, we did this. First, let's look at the oceans. Here's a whole bunch of different ocean models running from 1850 to 2100. And this is the ocean sink. And they all start with no sink when there's no extra CO2. And then they grow a sink that gets bigger over time. And these go out to the year 2100. But look at this amazing factor of two difference between some very hungry ocean models that suck down eight gigatons of CO2 by the end of the, end of the uh, century, and other ones that only suck down four gigatons of CO2 by the end of the century. But Jesus, you think that's bad? Look at land. On, on land, you know, there was no sink back in the day because things were balanced. Life and death were essentially in balance. And then sometime in the middle of the 20th century, the land started taking up CO2, and it takes up more and more. But oh my god, here's a model that by the end of the century is taking up almost 12 gigatons of carbon a year. <gasps> where, where would you put it? Uh, unbelievable. On the other hand, here's one that it's in the middle of the century, something terrible happens. And the carbon actually starts coming back out of, of the land and going into the atmosphere. So amplifying global warming. This one, it turns out, killed off the Amazon and converted the forest into grassland. And so whatever the carbon was in the trees and the roots and the litter and so forth turns, turns into CO2. Um, as a result of the spread of biogeochemistry, these climate models, for the same emissions, produce a, a spread of 300 ppm of CO2 by the end of the century. Oh my god, that, that's like as big of a difference as like you know, RCP 2.6 versus RCP 6 almost. A huge difference in CO2. And this is with the same emissions. Oh my god, what, what does net zero mean if 300 ppm of CO2 is a crapshoot depending on, on ecosystems? Wow. So this was a, a shock to climate modelers. Now, this part is going to be even more of a shock if you haven't already heard it, because the same models when, when forced for a really long time with a really large amount of, of emissions, produce a transient temperature increase. OK, so I have to think for a second, make sure everybody's on the same page here. The equilibrium climate sensitivity, 3 degrees per doubling of CO2, right? That's, that's if you doubled CO2 instantaneously. Nobody's doing that. And then waited a really long time, right? For, for like a thousand years or hundreds of years anyway, for the climate to completely equilibrate with that extra radiation. The transient warming is different. The transient warming is how much warming this year, right? How, how much warming given the amount of emissions we've, we've had up to now and no more? You're not going to wait around. You, you sort of tell me what, what the warming is now. And CMIP, uh, C4MIP, I didn't really give you the acronym. 
CMIP-5 was sort of the mid-teens uh, version of climate models, behaved the same way. This is very weird. What they show is a virtually linear response to cumulative CO2 emissions. So the idea here is every lump of coal you ever burned, ever, 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 in all of human history is part of the cumulative CO2 emissions of, of humanity. And every one of them gives you the same amount of warming. Like, wait a minute, we thought it was logarithmic. What's going on here? This is very, now they don't all have the same slope, but they almost all show this linear response. All right, a little weird, some algebra here. We can decompose this thing, the transient climate response to emissions, in terms of the change of temperature with emissions is equal to the change of temperature with CO2 times the change of CO2 with emissions, right? So temperature versus CO2, that's our, our familiar uh, climate sensitivity. But then uh, CO2 versus emissions, that's what depends on the sinks, right? That, that's really essentially given to you by the sinks. If, if the sinks suck down half of your emissions, then your CO2 with emissions is, is smaller than if you don't suck them down. Now this is potentially very complicated. Here's that linear response, right? Here's your temperature change. Here's the cumulative, the total amount of fossil fuel emissions in all of human history. There's TCRE, this sort of linear response. Now, what happens if the carbon cycle freaks out, right? What happens if you kill off the Amazon? Well, that's gonna change this. Uh, what happens if you're emitting stuff that's not CO2, like methane or N2O? What happens if uh, there's some sort of, uh, well, this is actually what we have expected, is this logarithmic falling off of, of the warming with respect to CO2. We've thought, known that for 125 years. So what the hell is it doing being linear? How, how can that be? Why is it constant? Fundamentally, uh, what, what happens is that the logarithmic rolling off of this curve, the, the, the saturation, if you will, of all those extra sunglasses, is being to some degree canceled out by an increasing sensitivity of CO2 to emissions. So that's the sinks stopping. The sinks get full. You, you've grown back your forest in Vermont. You've uh, given the plants all the nitrogen they ever could use and now they're just pissing it out into the rivers, Wh whatever. But, but this kind of CO2 curve cancels this kind of radiation or photon curve and you, you're left with this, this linear thing. Now there's another one that has really puzzled people, and that is what we call committed warming. So if you warm up the world, uh, the oceans are still colder. The, the oceans have a boatload of heat capacity, right? The oceans are much bigger than the air. And so as you warm the air, the oceans are always behind. And so there's heat going into the oceans all the time. And once you get to a certain, you know, you, you, you try to stop making the air hotter, then you've got all this stored heat in the oceans that can come back out. And so you have a, a sort of tendency for delayed effects from, from this giant heat capacity thing. So essentially, the people who are uh, promoting TCRE as a, as a unifying concept in climate models, and I'm sorry about the, the flashy graphics here. Uh, I'm gonna skip this because this is really where I'm going with this. It's dumb luck! It, it's like there's no fundamental physics or biology or chemistry with this thing. It's, it's coincidence, cancellation of three huge things. The, the radiative saturation of the atmosphere, the slow saturation of the sinks, and the interaction of all the other stuff, like the heat capacity of the ocean, the methane, the N2O, the changes in, in you know, aerosol from, from air pollution, all that stuff, so that it appears, no matter what, these are scenarios that go all the way up to RCP 8.5, out to 2,500 gigatons of, of emissions, no matter how much we emit, it's linear, according to dozens of models. These are, you know, now, you don't really want to badmouth this, these people. This is the IPCC. This is, this is the consensus of all of our colleagues. This is, this is not dumb people. These are, these are really smart people that we all know, that we, we believe they're you know, acting in good faith, but they think that we will get about two degrees of warming for every thousand gigatons of carbon that we burn ever 
And that's it. So we can replace a complex Earth system model with a single line of arithmetic that is independent of emissions. The, the implication is that for 2 degrees Celsius, we have about 400 gigatons remaining. See, this makes the, the remaining emissions thing super easy, right? If you know that you get a certain amount of warming for a total amount of emissions, all you got to do is divide by this number, and pff, that's how much carbon you can burn. Uh, 400 gigatons of carbon to keep it below 2C, and 100 gigatons of carbon to limit it to 1.5. Now, I told you at the beginning that we had a big problem keeping it below 1.5. What the fuck? These people are saying we got it. We got 1.5. We got 100 gigatons more we could burn. Come on. This should make you uneasy. It makes me uneasy. 1.5 is still alive because the sinks are expected to persist. The, the fundamental reason why people are drawing these lines for emissions going down to 2040 or 2060, depending on what your budget is, is because they think that when we stop burning carbon, the sinks will pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and compensate for the fact that the heat is coming out of the oceans. This is quite a claim. This is a very bold claim, in my opinion, having worked on this for, for a long time. Skip, skip a slide. There's a thing called the zero emission commitment. Okay, so here is time, and here is degrees of warming, and this is all observed. You know, it warmed up a lot early 20th century, then it flattened out for a while, and now it's warming up like crazy. This is a what if in uh, climate model space. If you turned off all of the emissions tomorrow, no, nobody's going to do that, but if you could, the warming would simply stop. There's no zero emission commitment. There's no warming in the pipeline. This other line is for constant concentration. If you hold the CO2 concentration the same as it is today, it would continue to warm because there's heat stored in the oceans that's going to come back out but not if you stop emitting. Because if you stop emitting, the models think the sinks will pull down the CO2. This is a remarkable thing. Now, maybe, you, you know. So when I was a little kid, I was skeptical. This is me. Um, you're telling me we can predict future carbon sinks under falling emissions so precisely that we can say they'll exactly cancel the changes in clouds, the changes in methane, changes in aerosol, changes in ocean heat uptake. This, this just makes me uneasy. I, 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 I find it odd. I will tell you why I find it odd. Um, sinks saturate. Really on the land, that's where, well, that's where I work. And I think the land sink is vulnerable. Why, why do I think it's vulnerable? CO2 fertilization, you could imagine continuing for a while, right? We, we got all this extra CO2, the plants are growing faster. Woo -hoo -hoo. You know, they're just going great guns. It's the, the, the Girl Scout cookies theory. On the other hand, you know, you put some miracle Grow on your tomatoes and they grow bigger. But if you put 10 times more miracle Grow, they're not going to grow 10 times more bigger, right? You, you, you will eventually, um, well, 10 times is probably stupid. But, but you will eventually meet the nitrogen demand of that, that plant, that pot, and uh, the, the nitrogen will simply pour out the bottom. Jill taught me that because of the lakes in Loch Vale. Um, and actually, if you give them enough nitrogen, they're going to be harmed by it, right? And then, then you're going to actually set them back. Um, regrowth in particular, oh my god, you, you know, you got 100-year-old trees in New England um, when they're 200 years old, they're not going to be growing faster than they're dying anymore. They're, they're going to be mature. They're going to be dropping off just like other trees. They're, they're only a sink when they're young. Boreal warming is probably the worst one, right? A, a little bit of boreal warming, and you get trees in the tundra. But a lot of boreal warming, and you got thawing permafrost. And then half of that comes out as methane. I mean, this is potentially terrible. So the idea that the sinks are just like on on a momentum trajectory and are going to continue in perpetuity just seems nuts to me. I, I told you, you got to be careful because these are good people that are saying this stuff. The ocean is probably a safe place to put CO2 in the, in the near term because it's gigantic and most of it is not touching the air. So it'll be in there for centuries. On the other hand, 
there's, uh, as they warm the surface, you, you slow down the, the mixing of this cold water to depth. So that slows that sink down. And probably the worst thing is ocean acidification, which then changes the whole chemistry of the oceans. And that has all kinds of knock-on effects that, that will ultimately um, stop the sinks. In fact, just, just think, just very simple box model here. Before the Industrial Revolution, there was no sink, right? The amount of CO2 that went into the plants from the atmosphere every year was matched by the amount that came out of the soils and went back into the atmosphere. There, there was life and death in balance. Similarly, the surface ocean would take up some CO2. It would mix with the deep ocean, but it would come back out. There was, there was no sink for thousands and thousands of years. When we put CO2 into the atmosphere, the PCO2 of the air was greater than the PCO2 that was in equilibrium of the plants and the PCO2 that was in equilibrium of the ocean. And so we started having arrows going down into both of these sinks. And you can imagine that if we slow our emissions or even stop our emissions, the PCO2 of the atmosphere in the oceans will equilibrate. And then the sink will go away, right? This is just sort of first order kinetics of the thing. You, you should expect that the sinks will, will saturate. So this leads me to kind of back to ambiguity. Like, Carbon sinks have sucked up 50% of our emissions as long as we've been able to measure them. That was actually quite a surprise. We, we did not expect that to be the case. Um, they have continued to scale with emissions. And when I was in graduate school, people wouldn't believe it. We were like, no way is that going to keep happening. But it did, and it did, and it did, and it did. And now we have a generation who's come up knowing about the sinks who are like, well, sure they will. I mean, it always does. So, so whoa. This is amazing that we've changed our, our conventional wisdom so much. If emissions cease and CO2 stops rising, what happens to those things? Are they going to fight us on the way down, just like they helped us on the way up? My instinct says yes, but my models, my friend's models say no. What if they're wrong? What if they're wrong about all this? That's, that's ambiguity. I recently read Michael Mann's new book, The New Climate War, and he has this wonderful framing using two important words. This problem is incredibly urgent, and we have agency. We, we can make a difference. Yes, it's scary, and yes, you can affect the outcome. They're both important to realize. You can't just, too many people, I, I, I worry about young people. I worry about people who went to college and got slammed with COVID. Oh my God. I worry about young people who come to my classes and learn about global warming and they go home and cry or drink. You know, it's, it's scary. But that doesn't mean it's time to give up. That doesn't mean that you don't have agency. Is there hope is the wrong question. There is no such thing as game over or too late or you're screwed. It is certainly not the case that we have only 12 years to act. This is something you're going to have to keep doing, even with the ambiguity, for all the rest of your lives. The stakes will always be enormous. Time will always be short. There is never going to be an excuse to give up about this. It's getting to be a little dated, but how many of you watched Game of Thrones? More than one. So. Uh, there was a character in there um, who, at the beginning of the series, she was a little girl, Ar Arya Stark, and she uh, was learning to sword fight with this guy, the, uh, I forget his name, this guy from Bravos, who was like teaching her how to defend her, so he said, you know, stick him with the sharp end. So she was a little kid, and of course she grew up to be a super badass, and she killed the Night King, or for spoilers, if you haven't seen it. <laughs> um, anyway, there's this, there's this scene that's actually become a meme now, and I'm going to share it with you. Uh, so let's see if I get this right. So, so uh, some of the people in that fantasy world uh, believe in the old gods, and some of them believe in the new gods. And so this little girl asks her teacher, do you believe in the old gods or the new gods? And he says, there is only one god, the god of death death. And what do we say to the God of death? 
not today. <laughs> so that's what I will leave you with, um, not today. Thank you. Do we do Q and A? I'd be yeah. delighted. Yeah. Or just throw things or say what you want. Yes. Wow, great question. So, so um, the, the question is, uh, how, how do we uh, communicate with policymakers or with the public about our science and about, uh, about what matters to us in order to make a difference in the world? And I, I think, you know, you know uh, so some of this is like, uh, you can get this in books, right? Be yourself. Um, let your personality come out. Don't, don't try to hide behind a bunch of five syllable words and fancy graphics and stuff that people don't know the meaning of the acronyms. So, to speak in plain English, um, talk about stuff people care about because otherwise they're not gonna care. Um, some of it is, uh, is a matter of practice. You, you, you Take, take opportunities to, to talk to people outside your field. Um, so just runs a summer uh, climate or sustainability, I'm forgetting what it's called, communications thing. And you should try that. That's really awesome. You, you're paired with people like, for example, report, uh, environment reporters from the New York Times or from uh, CNN. And, and, and you are interviewed about your work and um, tell your story. Uh, I, I saw this amazing presentation, uh, not, not live, uh, on video um, by Alan Alda, the guy who was on MASH, you know, back in the day. He now runs this um, science communication institute at uh, Stony Brook in, in, outside of New York City. And uh, he, he does basically improv theater with graduate students, um, giving them prompts and having them react. And, you know, he's got that irreverent style and... Uh, he, he did a before and after with this woman who um, is doing fascinating work with um, worms that live in deep sea trenches in the bottom of the Atlantic. And, uh, you know, she talks on camera and she's like looking at her feet and she's using huge words and she's explaining this in a way like as if she was trying to impress her advisor. And then the after was that same woman on the Colbert Report. Um, and you know how brutal he is uh, to, to people on his show. And she just held her own and she was confident. She like told good stories. I, I don't know how you learn this, but um, yeah, practice, uh, be yourself, use regular English. I ho hope that was helpful. <laughs> Anybody else? What? Yeah. Uh, oh, cool. It is working? Okay. Um, it feels like there's always new information coming out, and I was just wondering, like, how you personally, like, try to keep it all updated in your head or, you know, like, like not asserting that you are knowing something that may change within, like, the next year or, like, two years. Yeah, or wow. That's a great, great question. So, I mean, all of us, no matter what our science or, or even non-science, right, in, in almost all that areas of academia, uh, we, we are trying to keep up with a changing field. Um, so, I mean, to some degree, it, it, it's our professional obligation, right? We, we read the literature, we're, we're keeping up. Um, nowadays, a lot of it is, uh, you know, blogs and uh, social media, uh, pe people go going to hear talks. And, like, did you guys know about this TCRE thing before? Was that, like, widely known, that, that, that warming is linear with emissions? Isn't that remarkable? So here I've told you something, right? And that, now you can tell your friends. Um, I, 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 I mean, how do we do this? Uh, we use Web of Science, we use Google Scholar, we use uh, email lists. And, and, and I mean, honestly, a lot of people share stuff on social media now. Um, 
f follow the leaders in your field on Twitter or uh, I, I wouldn't say TikTok, right? But you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. Did that help? Yeah, awesome. Tom. I'd like you to speak to the idea about about personal action uh, and its role in solving this crisis. There's a lovely article. I I think it was in the New Yorker. I, but basically, it was saying this is what the 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 25 corporations that account for 80 percent of fossil fuel emissions want you to think uh -huh. that this is your problem. Yeah. You need to get an induction stove right. instead of a natural gas stove. You need to buy an electric car. And that, and I just wonder yeah. where you come down on this. Well, that's a, that's a great question, a real question for our times. Um, and actually, it's a question that often promotes people yelling at each other. So, so let's acknowledge that, that people might have different opinions about what I'm about to say, <laughs> and, and that's OK. Uh, so. Uh, I, I actually don't pay too much attention to this particular statistic that 25% of, or 25 greatest country, companies or big, baddest companies, whatever. But, but look, um, whether you believe TCRE or not, um, in order to stop the problem from getting worse, we have to stop setting carbon on fire. Now that's not just you, and it's not just me, it's everybody forever. Now, this is not something I can do by myself. Um, we all of us have to have a replacement for fire. Jesus, this is a huge ask, right? We have to have the ability to live decent lives. And when I say live decent lives, you know, they're, they're, we have it pretty freaking good, right? We, we here in this room and in this country and in the, in the developed world emit almost all the carbon. We, we the ten, top 10% 10 of emitters are the huge, you know, burners of carbon. But there's billions and billions of other people who actually have really crappy physical resource, right? There's something like 2 billion people who have no toilets. There are something like one and a half billion people who have no access to electricity. So, so whatever we're going to say about this, we, we have to acknowledge that there's a whole bunch of people who actually have sort of energy poverty at the same time that we have this energy surplus. So it, it isn't the kind of thing that, that an induction stove is going to fix. We, we have to have a global energy economy that isn't based on carbon combustion. That, that's asking a lot. We have to have solar and we have to have wind, but those are intermittent, so we have to have some kind of clean, firm uh, power, like, for example, hydro or nuclear that have environmental problems or geothermal that can firm that up. We have to have uh, uh, transmission lines that'll carry it from where it is to where it's needed. We have to have some sort of storage that can move it from when we have it to when we need it. Um, all of that has to be integrated together in a way that is affordable, that can uh, address the energy poverty of billions of people who are super poor. This is a huge thing. It's not the kind of thing you can do by riding your bike. You, you, you got to push. You got to push, you know, politically. Um, we talk about, I mean, I, I sometimes despair about the, the politics in our country, right? Our, our country is messed up. Um, but, but get this, fewer than 5% of people are American. Um, not 95% of the world doesn't live here. Um, that they're actually moving forward uh, on this when we're dragging our feet. So we, we got to get our own country together, but we can have some hope that if, if, we, if our country drags its feet too long, we won't matter anymore. We'll be the, the backward people that didn't do this. I, I, I don't know. It's kind of weird. So, so now let me circle back to your real question and say, um, I'm, I'm very persuaded by Catherine Hayhoe's version of the answer to this question. You know what her first priority is? It's not your bike. It's not your thermostat. It's not your sweater. 
Uh, it's not your, your lunch. It's talk to each other. It, it's talk about it all the time. Talk about it over dinner. Talk about it with your friends. To, uh, get together and have, have, you know, journal clubs or, or whatever. Talk, talk to the Girl Scouts. Talk to the Rotary. To, talking to each other is how political things happen. And yeah, if you want to run for office, more power to you. Uh, if you absolutely, you should vote, for God's sakes. Yeah, you know? But, and, you know, I, I got solar power. I, I, uh, I remodeled a 100-year-old house in Fort Collins to, to use uh, super-duper insulation, and I've got an uh, air source heat pump. Um, I have an induction stove. Um, I drive an electric car. I mean, trying to do all these things. But, but if it's just me, it doesn't work. It's got to be everybody. Dennis, you had something. Yeah, I guess getting back into the science. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you're advocating a, a simplified model, a linear model. But I'm not the, advocating. I'm t telling you I'm skeptical of it. Okay. The, that as we look at you know, the, the complexity of these Earth system models, what are, the, what are the needed advances that we need to look at to, to understand the surprises that are taking place around the globe, you, you, are, you, know, you identified the warming of the Arctic, the boreal system, and the potential for methane emissions. We're seeing incredible changes in, this, in the Arctic sea ice um, and the ramifications of those. I know that the models aren't very good at those uh, processes. They're getting better. But where do we actually start focusing on sort of where do the contemporary observations yeah. guide us into what we need to do with our model uh, development yeah. to, so that we can get the story so, better? So thank you for asking this. Um, I, I think one of the things I, I, I'm shocked that we don't have more of is um, for people like, like you, people like us, is um, how does biogeochemistry behave in a world of falling emissions, right? We, we actually have a lot of data about what happens when the CO2 is going up. But we don't really have very much data about what happens if CO2 levels off. And here you're taking these models. So Dennis and I have talked about this for 30 years. So, so, so I, I worry about like a little bit of insider uh, baseball here. But, but there's like two knobs, right? One of them is like how much CO2 fertilization is there. And the other is how sensitive is soil carbon to temperature. And, and by tweaking those knobs, you can get almost anything. The, 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 the trade-off between the increase in, in decomposition with temperature and the increase in photosynthesis with CO2 um, is ridiculously under constraint. But those guys, those guys, the, those lovely men and women who are our friends, um, ha have, uh, ha have had it easy because they're assuming the CO2 is always going up. And now they're taking those same models with those same tuned dials and saying, oh, no, it, it's just going to keep doing it. Well, what a bunch of hooey. We, we've got to have actual experiments. What, what happens to a face study when you turn the CO2 down? Do we even know how to do that to, to a forest? Um, what happens to ocean chemistry when the CO2 falls? One last thing I can tell you, trying to get me off of here. So, so, so um, in, in 1964, the US and the Soviet Union did a terrible thing. They blew off dozens of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. And uh, they shouldn't have done it, and we wish they hadn't have done it, but it made a fantastic geochemical tracer, which is radiocarbon CO2 in the atmosphere. And for whatever it is, like 70 years since then, 60 years since then, the CO2, the radioactive CO2 has been taken up by plants, turned into soil carbon, taken up by the ocean, turned into bicarbonate in the deep ocean. We've been able to follow that radiocarbon pulse through the carbon cycle, and it's been one of the most valuable carbon cycle experiments ever done. That radiocarbon is starting to come back out of the oceans. There are places on Earth where Bomb C-14 is no longer going into the ocean. It's coming out of the ocean. And that suggests that the same thing happens to CO2. Because chemically and biologically, the radiocarbon CO2 is the same as any other CO2. It's just got little stickers on its forehead that says, I was made in 1964. And so you can find it easy. 
And by the fact that it went in and now it's coming out, we can probably surmise that something similar to that is going to happen to the, to the carbon from fossil fuel carbon. And that ought to be a warning to us about relying on these sinks to be part of our net zero. Our net zero is probably zero. It's probably not two gigatons or three gigatons of emissions that accounts for airplanes and, and steel mills and, and God knows what all else. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank uh, the great questions, great yes. answers, great talk. Thank you. A plaque will be arriving. In Ooh. the meantime, you can cover your head with that beautiful hat. Oh, thank you. And you get a GDPE coffee mug as well for your coffee or tea. I was smiling, but you and, can't see. Um, I'd like, so uh, before we do a round of applause, I'd just like to say there are some sandwiches over there, a vegetarian and vegan, or a vegan option and a gluten-free option and meat option and not meat option and some other snacks. I also want to, I promise the food at the next one will be better as long as there is this continuing drop in COVID cases. This was planned when we were at like, whoo, peak. Like, are we even going to be in the room? Right. And so, uh, so please help yourselves and don't think that this is representative of how I think about food because I think about it very seriously. <laughs> um, and with that, let's thank Scott for his fantastic talk. Thank you all. Thank you.